All right, welcome back. This is some bonus features. Bonus features of lesson 13. So the first time through lesson 13, uh, in the end, I kind of rushed it through, um, did the main focus of Lenin and did the main focus of Stalin, but definitely felt like it could have done a better job of the post-Stalin era. So looking at lesson number 13 here, um, definitely there's some key reading in the beginning to talk about the conditions under which the communist revolution comes to Russia and then transforms it into the Soviet Union. Excellent review of Marxism early on in this document as well. And from a theor theoretical standpoint, you definitely need to know that content on page 10. And the what is communism, communism compares to socialism again. I did that in the other video. So I'm not gonna focus on that on this video as much. Got some great cartoons here though, talking about that uh, class struggle, that class warfare. So what we did a great job with in the other video was talk about Lenin, talk about Stalinism. So we're not gonna focus on that. We're gonna skip over it. We're gonna go to that post-Stalin era. One thing I wanna focus on is the stagnation on Russia. And we actually see that quite clearly in this video. History of Russia in 100 Minutes by Smart Histories. Freshness Stagnation. The Khrushchev Thaw was followed by the 20-year rule of Leonid Brezhnev. It was a time of relaxed foreign relations and internal standstill. During Brezhnev's era of stagnation, the Soviet Union became politically, economically, and socially backward, and the need for reforms grew increasingly acute. Joint leadership. Many high-level communists believed that the Khrushchev thaw had gone too far and that his politics needed to be reversed. Khrushchev's rule was replaced by the joint leadership of three men, Leonid Brezhnev, Alexei Kozygin, and Nikolai Podgorny. There was some experimentation with reforms in the beginning, but Brezhnev managed to outmaneuver the other two. With Leonid Brezhnev now in full power, the reactionary political groups had won. Era of Stagnation The following two decades became known as the Era of Stagnation. It was a time of standstill and limited freedom. Censorship increased, and political dissidents were oppressed and imprisoned. Communist propaganda saw its revival, also there was less criticism of Stalin's crimes. Stagnation became visible in all levels of society, and economy, in politics, and in culture. Foreign policy. In 1968, Czechoslovakia was going through the Prague Spring. The leader, Alexander Dubček, was experimenting with liberal reforms, which were to be called socialism with a human face. Brezhnev and his advisors in Moscow decided to send tanks in Prague to put down the popular movement. Thus, the right of the Soviet Union to intervene militarily in the affairs of other satellite states came to be known as the Brezhnev Doctrine. Detente. The time from 1969 to 1972 is known as the Relaxation of Tensions, or Detente. The Soviet Union and the United States made several efforts to mutually contain the arms race and minimize conflict. Its peak was Richard Nixon's visit to Moscow in 1972. Another highlight was the 1975 Helsinki Accords, when Western countries agreed to accept Soviet hegemony over Eastern Europe in exchange for more civil rights for its inhabitants. Thereafter, relations turned colder again, and remained so until the perestroika of 1985. It was reinforced by the Afghan War, 1979 to 1989, where the Soviet Union was unable to conquer Afghanistan. Gerontocracy. Brezhnev died in 1982. He was 75 years old. Two of his followers, Yuri Antropov and Konstantin Chernenko, was also sick and old and did nothing to reform the Soviet Union. Though, they carried on the era of gentocracy, rule of old people. By the mid-1980s, the Soviet Union was no longer at a standstill, but rather in an extensive political, economic, and social crisis. It needed reforms in order to survive. Thank you. All right, so the purpose of that video was to bridge the gap between Stalin and Gorbachev. And during that time period, it's definitely critical to focus on the stagnation of the Soviet Union. It stagnated economically, but it also stagnated politically and socially. And we see the re-Stalinization under Brezhnev. 
as they ended up fearing that the reforms that Khrushchev had initiated was the cause of the stagnation. Uh, during that time period, lots of key terms came up, like detente that we'll see during the Cold War, and other terms like gerontocracy, the rule by old people. So definitely bridges the gap a little bit between Stalin and Gorbachev. Uh, we also have a video here about what life would have been like under this stagnation. The key during this video is we go inside a grocery store and the message we're supposed to be receiving is that it's inefficient. You can see that most of the products are in boxes, you can't see them, you got to kind of open up the box yourself, see what's inside, there's a lot of confusion. Um, you can see that the products themselves don't look that great and there's a shortage of them. So because there's not enough competition, there's shortage in the marketplace. Because the state is overemphasizing guns at the expense of butter, they're beginning to lose the hearts and minds of these citizens. That these citizens look like they're living not their best life. So their lives are being diminished because the state is answering the three basic economic questions. What to produce, how to produce it, and who to give it to. And although they are meant to be practicing egalitarianism, uh, some closest or party, uh, party officials, the party elite and the Politburo, seem to be living better lives than these, the average Soviet citizens. Sure, the marketplace is bustling, but uh, again, there's very limited stuff. So when we went to the Soviet Union in 1989, there were stores that the visitors could go to that the uh, locals could not. And uh, that created some black market bartering opportunities on the streets as the Moscovites craved the products that we had access to or the products that we would have brought with us. Uh, There's people on our tour that traded Levi's jeans for you know, heirlooms from World War II because the Soviet citizens of 1989 so hungered for that window to the West that they're willing to trade their history to get what we took, took advantage of or took for advantage, right? Um, we didn't consider how amazing the products were that we had. So the story goes that when Khrushchev visited the Soviet, or visited the United States back in the 1950s, Khrushchev understood then that the Cold War was lost. That, uh, again, this kind of sounds like a legend, but he goes to a grocery store and uh, sees all the variety that's offered at an American grocery store, all the different types of cereals, and he understood then that the hearts, the war over the hearts and minds of the people of the world, the Cold War, was one that the Soviets could not win. So the Soviets tried to keep relevant in that Cold War by creating enough weapons to be a counter force against the American military machine, but that simply is not going to be enough. So by the mid-1980s, there's going to be a need to reform the Soviet Union, and they do that through a reformer called Mikhail Gorbachev. And Mikhail Gorbachev is going to introduce political and economic reform. His economic reform and his political reform will end up actually um, speeding up the downfall of the Soviet Union. So it doesn't save the Soviet Union like he wanted. His economic reform is called Perestroika, and his political reform is called Glasnost. And here's a quick video about his attempted reform, Perestroika. History of Russia in 100 Minutes by Smart Histories. Gorbachev's Perestroika. When Mikhail Gorbachev assumed power in 1985, his goal was to bring the Soviet Union out of its economic and political deadlock while still preserving socialism. Instead, he unintentionally ignited the process that led to the collapse of the whole Soviet system. Background. Mikhail Gorbachev was only 54 when he was elected General Secretary in March 1985. He brought fresh air and new thinking to the party. Perestroika and Glasnost. 
The Soviet model of a planned economy had completely fallen into crisis, and Gorbachev was determined to launch large-scale reform campaigns, perestroika, restructuring, and glasnost, openness. Foreign policy, new economic reforms, demanded funds, and Russia could no longer keep up with the United States in the global arms race. Gorbachev proposed to end the arms race and establish warmer diplomatic relations. For this, he repeatedly met with President Ronald Reagan, and relations did, indeed, relax. He ended the Afghan war and began pulling Soviet troops out of Eastern Europe. On the 9th of November 1989, the Berlin Wall was taken down by the public during a mass demonstration. Meanwhile, other Eastern Bloc states also became democracies, which Gorbachev could not help but accept. Political reforms. In 1989, Gorbachev's reforms introduced presidential power and the first free elections in Russia in 72 years. The newly elected Congress of People's Deputies assembled for the first time on the 25th of May 1989. Rebellions. But Gorbachev's economic reforms did not work and the living standard of people worsened. In many Soviet republics, the struggle for autonomy and then for independence gathered momentum. Moscow sent tanks to put down popular movements, but it was already too late. It became more and more evident that the Soviet Union was in itself a relic of the past. Gorbachev was juggling between the reformists and the reactionaries, and he was preparing the new Union Treaty to save the empire. Meanwhile, the importance of the Russian Soviet Federative Republic and its president, Boris Yeltsin, was growing. Collapse of the Soviet Union. On the 19th of August 1991, the August Putsch began. The reactionary group, led by Vladimir Krichkov, Dmitry Yazov, and Gennady Yonayev, locked Gorbachev in his Crimean estate and tried to establish power under the State Committee on the State of Emergency. Tanks were sent to Moscow, but people blocked their way, and Boris Yeltsin took control. On his return, Gorbachev lost most of his authority to Yeltsin. On the 8th of December 1991, Boris Yeltsin, Lenin Kravchuk of Ukraine, and Stanislav Shushkevich of Belarus signed the Creation Treaty of the Commonwealth of Independent States (CIS) without informing Gorbachev beforehand. The Soviet Union was officially dissolved on the 26th of December 1991. Thank you for watching. For that so because this course is a course about ideologies, it is natural that it's also a study of the application of the ideology. And the Soviet Union is an interesting case study because, at least in theory, it's about the application of Marxism, of communism, which becomes Leninism and Stalinism. And therefore, we need to understand the entire story. Why communism comes to Russia, how communism transforms Russia, how communism stagnates in Russia, and ultimately how communism ends up uh, losing the hearts and minds of the people and the Soviet Union collapses. So we have that as our kind of bonus features we're looking at here today. So the fall of the USSR is continued in my online textbook. There's lots of uh, articles for you to read and additional videos. But we also have a number of A1 sources about the fall. So for example, we have this uh, very long document here. Uh, actually, this is the shorter version. This is from March of 1938. So this shows communism during Stalinism. Uh, you could argue at its peak uh, in the Soviet Union in the sense of this is the time that was uh, transforming the Soviet Union. But as we read this passage, we can see the cost uh, to the people. Our whole country is awaiting and demanding one thing. The traitors and spies who are selling their country must be shot like dirty dogs. Our people are demanding one thing. Crush the accursed reptile. Time will pass the graves. The hateful traitors will grow over with weeds and thistles. But over us, over our happy country, our sun will shine bright and luminous as before. Over the roads cleared of the last scum and filth of the past, we, with our beloved leader and teacher, the great Stalin, at our head, will march, as before, onwards and onwards towards communism. So, it's from 1938, it's the prosecutor at the show trial, so we have to understand the prosecutor is representing the government, the government is a totalitarian regime under Stalin. Uh, this is at a time where Stalin has already, in 1933, 1934, purged his own leadership of his party, the Politburo, and therefore 
the speaker is really just a parrot of what Stalin would want to have said about him. So the uh, purpose of the source is to glorify Stalin in this cult of personality. The purpose of the, of the source is also to play a role in this another purge, which is the show trial of these, these reptiles, uh, these traitors, uh, people like eventually Trotsky that will be caught in Mexico City. Um, but it definitely shows the techniques of dictatorship. We have the cult of a leader. We have force and intimidation and show trials and secret police and all those things that either are implicitly or explicitly part of the source. And what we don't really see is a lot of uh, Marxist theory. You know, is there class warfare here? We definitely have an us versus them. We have a lot of we discussion, but some of the original um, purpose behind this is being getting lost and, and it's becoming more about Stalin. So we have one that is uh, glorifying Stalin, and two, now we are down in 1991 and we have the Soviet Union collapses and all the SSR is going in their opposite directions, including Russia, who wanted to leave under Boris Yeltsin. So we go from this place where it's like, you know, USSR is first, Stalin's first, you know, I would give up my life for the USSR. And down here we have this uh, linear relationship where suddenly we have the USSR is no longer something people are interested in. So having these two sources as a part of the set allows us an opportunity to talk about how the hearts and minds of the Soviet people changed from 38 until 1991. Uh, some of them changed because of the force and intimidation and the terror that Stalin brought upon the Soviet people. But honestly, a lot of people looked at Stalin when he dies in 53 as a hero. And potentially, you could argue that the USSR collapses because there is no one that could replace Stalin. There is no one that had that kind of authority, that kind of command of the nation, that uh, cult of personality. And now we have this other source. We find ourselves in a struggle not just for the survival of our people, but for the very soul of mankind. The American toxin, that is liberalism, is infecting the hearts and minds of our class brothers, and we must respond. Some believe that the re recently rebranded re United Nations may be a vehicle to address global suffering. But where a fool sees a liberator, events in the Korean Peninsula enable a wise man to see a puppet of imperialism. Just as religion was once the great opiate that distract the marginalized, today we allow trivial simplicities like flags and anthems and pledges to keep us separated. But we cannot justify ignoring the plight of others because they lie on the other side of some artificial line. All workers must unite if this paradigm shift is to become a global tide, tidal wave and wash the oppressors from our history. Each of us must be a leader in the struggle as we guard against the insidious incursions of American culture into our own lives. A key to victory in this unprecedented battle for world opinion will be to ensure we are worthy of emulation. Our actions at home must reflect the dogma we are expounding globally. There will be casualties, and we too must be ever diligent to not fall prey to the indoctrination of the West. If we stay united, we will have paradise. Wow. That's a great source, lots to unpack in the source, but I'm looking at relationships here as well. And three fills in that gap between one and two. It even says recently we're branded UN, so we know it's from 1945. It does say events in the Korean Peninsula, so it's probably more like 1950 in the Korean War, but it's definitely at the beginning of the Cold War, and there's a lot of hope that the Soviets and the communists will, will see this as, you know, as Marx predicted, a worldwide revolution. Um, but there's the fear in there that their hearts and minds will be lost to the West. And that's what ends up happening, is that the hearts and minds of the people on this boat are like, you know what, I want my Levi's, I want my bubblegum, I want my MTV, I don't want Marxism, I want liberalism, I want democracy, I want Westernism. So um, this quote that is meant to be from, you know, 1950 um, is really, filling in the linear story here, the chronological story, and it basically we can understand through it why we go from here to here. Is because instead of winning this global war that they're talking about, they do fall prey to the indoctrination of the West through the propaganda from Hollywood and others. So that's a great set. I can see needing to do that set at some point. Now we have our extensive set of sources about the fall of the USSR. So in this set, 
there's just a number of sources that look at why the Soviet Union falls. And um, we can see the expenditures on defense. We can see the struggling with the United States, um, visualizing 25 years of military expenditure around the world. Um, lots of great quotes, lots of great cartoons. I am the great and powerful Soviet Union. And you can see if you zoom in here a little bit, you know, the Soviet Union looks great and powerful, but like the Wizard of Oz, it's just this old man, the Soviet social system that is in need of massive reform. Um, Post-Soviet Russia, though, you can see things get a lot worse. So there's going to be a time in post-Soviet Russia that people are like, you know what, maybe it wasn't great. Soviet Union ceases to exist Christmas 1991. Look at what happens the next year, hyperinflation of prices. So under a centrally planned economy, there's wage and price controls that help to stabilize the economy and protect it um, so that all can have a standard of living above the poverty line. But when the economy quickly trans transitions from a central plan to a free market economy, then prices are allowed to fluctuate, and fluctuate they did. Look how much they went up. And you can, you can deduce from these numbers that in these years, there's a lot of suffering in those SSRs that broke away. And it would make sense that some would say, you know what, maybe we should have gone back. So here's a cartoon looking at that same idea. Communism was waiting two hours to buy bread. Capitalism is waiting two years to be able to afford it. So probably better under communism. Even though communism was inefficient, at least after two hours you have bread. Here you can see some of the numbers of things increasing, like bread. So some data to support that cartoonist. Then we have a Pew uh, poll, and it looks at the approval of change to democracy from 1991 to 2009. And you can see that you know a lot of countries, look at Ukraine, they, by 2009, they're not in love with democracy anymore. So there's a lot of countries that uh, Maybe their hearts and minds were looking towards um, democracy, but it wasn't quite what they had hoped for. It's interesting that they show their approval to political liberalism and then their approval to economic liberalism. And then from this, you can see you know, which countries end up liking, say, capitalism more or less than democracy. The numbers are pretty consistent. But you can see, like, say, Hungary is much more um, in favor of democracy than they were of capitalism. Here you have a cartoon that is uh, from the 1980s, um, maybe 1990, but it's before the fall of the Soviet Union because you have Mikhail Gorbachev thinking that he can save it, save it through perestroika and glasnost. But we look at this house, and, and maybe it's a teardown, and it's on a cliff. And so the foundation, the architectural foundation of, of this is no longer stable. The place it was built is, is no longer stable. Uh, it's creating a lot of waste. It's, uh, the roof is, ar is, is archaic. You know, there's, there's more modern forms of architecture now. And um, it's, it's not a dream house with a few little changes. So a couple of skylights, that would be a reference to his, his reforms, right? And, you know, we just do a couple of skylights and this thing is going to be a dream house. And, his, uh, his helpers here are saying, not to him directly, because he is still the leader of the Soviet Union, you wouldn't want to question him directly, but they're saying, I think Comrade Mikhail Gorbachev, Comrade Mike, has been hitting the vodka. Here you have another source. Oh, imagine communism just self-destructing like that. And um, you can see that the source is actually suggesting that the United States is self-destructing. So we have a link here to a number of other sources that one could look at. Um, to further look at the transformation of the Soviet Union back to one that embraces liberalism. What the hell, maybe it is time we buried Lenin and you got all of these signs of like Bloomingdale's, Kentucky Fried Chicken, Sears, signs of the Western world, McDonald's. This is a good one. If we keep on with the arms race, after a while the Russian economy will collapse, but it's from the Americans. This is Ronald Reagan, and the cartoonist is actually suggesting that the United States will be the one that sees economic collapse. Now, the cartoonist will be proven wrong. It will be the Soviet Union that will see economic ruin because of the arms race, but 
Um, the legacy of debt that Reagan created is still an intergenerational tyranny that continues. So we have some other stuff. We have this one, Soviet imperialism is trying to help this guy uh, get out of poverty. So this could potentially be a part of that pro-Soviet propaganda. We have this one here that has US movies, Donald Duck and stuff sneaking in through the Iron Curtain. And uh, you could argue this is how they lose the wars because hearts and minds of Soviet citizens begin to dream of Western culture. So, got lots of stuff going on here. In general, what are your personal feelings about Stalin? Um, and this, you can see a lot of admiration and respect. Nice to know what year this is from. I want to say this is from the 1990s. This is after Stalin has died. So to what extent do you agree or disagree with the following statement? Stalin was a cruel, inhum inhuman tyrant who is guilty of killing millions. Um, although they agree, they still believe he, he was wise and they still respect him and admire him. So there is an interesting um, connection here that you know, they respect, admire him, but they understand that he was guilty of killing millions. So, interesting connection. So definitely some things to further understand Stalin and his relationship with his people there. Soviet sentimental, sentimentality, Russians regret at USSR's collapse hits 14 year high. So there is a number of people in the Soviet Union today, including maybe their leader, Vladimir Putin, in Russia today, I should be saying that uh, kind of look back quite fondly to the time of the USSR. Here's some further numbers as to how the people felt towards Stalin during different time periods. So this is nice because it gives you the years and stuff like that. And you can see that still today, uh, there's quite a bit of respect and admiration there. May not be as high as it once was when Stalin was the leader, it's still quite amazing. You wouldn't see numbers like this in the in Germany uh, in terms of how do you feel about uh, Adolf Hitler. And then we have some more numbers. Do you regret the collapse of the USSR? And you can see that uh, in Russia today, uh, the majority of people do regret the collapse of the USSR. So some further sources there for you to look at for sure. We've got some of them in here. This is the idea that the uh, you know, Soviet Union is collapsing. It's the people's will. Let's break it apart. Yay, we're getting jeans and burgers and democracy and stuff like that. This is going to be great. But out of it comes all these bad things instead. So that's the end of the USSR video. And at the end here, there's the birth and death of a liberal democracy. And it talks about how uh, Boris Yeltsin ends up returning authoritarianism back the USSR.